right, this is Jake Adams from Reef Builders here. I'm in uh, sunny Rhinelander, Wisconsin, where the temperatures are really dipping with Kevin, Cord, Kevin Cohen, director of Lab Aquaria. Good to see you, buddy. Thanks nice for to see you, Jake. Yeah, it's great um, to have you. You have such an incredible facility here. I don't even know where to start, but I kind of want to start with you because you had a lot to do with the, the beginning of this place. So tell me about the, the roots and the beginnings of uh, Lab Aquaria. Well, we started Lab Aquaria in the year 2000. Uh, we started in Dayton, Ohio, in a company called Pet Warehouse, and we moved up here to Rhinelander, Foster and Smith had purchased Live Aquaria. Um, so it started up here in 2002, continued on with our website. Uh, in 2005, we decided it was you know, incredibly important that we you know, promote ourselves in the you know, most positive direction that we could go, so we wanted to build a coral farm to try to you know, offset some of the, the wild harvest that's out there. And, also to you know really set the standard or, or set the stage for more propagated corals in the marine aquarium industry. So before you jump ahead to the farm, can you tell me about like what is your role at Live Aquaria? What do you do on a day to day? I'm the director of Live Aquaria, so I manage all of the uh, inner workings of the website as well as acquisition of aquatic life um, that we offer our valued customers. I work with our coral farm staff here on a daily basis. Um, we have 18 full-time people. Um, we have a support staff that does the Diver's Den as well. Um, the Diver's Den is our WYSIWYG uh, livestock where we take photographs of corals and clams and invertebrates and fish and offer them for sale on the Live Aquaria website. How many orders do you receive and process on a daily basis in general? Uh, quite a few, actually. I mean, I can't you know, disclose specific numbers, but you know, we're constantly bringing in shipments into our facility here. And the reason for that is, unlike a lot of people in the trade or a lot of, of retailers, we look at it a little bit differently. We want to actually hold the livestock and condition the livestock prior to offering it for sale. It's incredibly important that we offer a very solid product, uh, solid fish bowls and invertebrates to our customers because we have a 14-day arrival life guarantee, arrival life stay alive guarantee. Um, and you know, it's incredibly important that we take care of our customers, and right. that's what our, our sole focus is here. Um, you guys are really uh, lauded for being some of the best shippers around. You put a lot of extra packaging in there, a lot of water, multiple number of bags. You guys really don't skip on that. So, what is it about this extreme cold weather that's had you suspend orders in a really, really rare case? I mean, we really look at the weather very closely. Obviously, it's very cold here in Wisconsin today. It's, you know, minus 20. So we're not shipping out of our facility. We, we obviously use heat packs and ice packs, depending That's on That's just a little too extreme, though. Yeah, the ambient temperature. But you can only compensate so much in, the, in these extremes. And, you know, I've shipped fish. Um, I started in the industry working in a retail pet store when I was 16 years old. I worked there for eight years, went to college, or graduated from college. I, I worked for a big import-export uh, marine livestock and freshwater livestock a wholesaler in the Midwest. And right. you know, I really learned a lot about shipping fish. Um, and shipping any of the animals, basically, and you know, it really plays a part in a lot of the stuff that we do today. Um, as long as you guys have been around, you, you're definitely the gold standard as far as it comes to uh, shipping livestock and, and sourcing exotic fish and, and nice corals. What do you think? Uh, what is it about the culture here at Live Aquaria that makes you special? That makes you still be, you know, the, the far and away the leader on, on that front? I, I think it's you know our staff. I mean, we really have some great people. Here at our company and very enthusiastic and, and, and me as well. I mean, I'm a hardcore fish, marine fish enthusiast, and I think that drives a, a lot of the stuff that we do in here. And, you know, corals as well have, you know, SPS tanks and, you know, many different types of reef tanks when they have you here. And, you know, so I'm a hardcore hobbyist and, and I try to, you know, have those, instill those values in, in my staff here as well. And I think that that really shows in the offerings that we have on our website. How, uh, what are some of the things that you do? You alluded to earlier about the coral farm. What are some of the other things you do that try to to, to be um, a delicate citizen of this community that we have to, as far as like in, in enhancing sustainability and promoting those kind of issues? I mean, that's incredibly important nowadays. The marine aquarium trade faces a, a lot of uh, pressures from the outside, and it's important that that we take a lead role in trying to be as sustainably, you know, minded as possible and. And how we do that is we really try to work with companies that have the same ideology and the same philosophy as we do, in that try to source fish uh, whenever possible through the shortest supply chains that we can, 
uh, the South Pacific is one great place. Right. Fiji, for example, is so, so regional stations. sourcing is a big part. You bet. Getting the right fish. Regional sourcing is incredibly important. I mean, there's a, a variety of places you can purchase fish from. Um, what What's most important to me is that whenever possible, I know where the fish were collected, what export station they were shipped at, when they were shipped, how they were handled. So if, if you are minded, or if you, you're really cognizant about the whole supply chain, it's a much better end product for our customers. Right. We're receiving way healthier fish, um, better, you know, a shorter supply chain, less handling through the, the chain of custody. In turn, it's a better animal right when it gets into our door. So we have, you know, I think we're, we're starting a little bit ahead of some others that maybe Let purchase me, uh, fish in other areas. What do you consider, val what is the value added to the fish? Well, just by conditioning the fish, getting them used to being in a captive environment, getting them used to seeing people and basically, you know, settled into a captive environment. When we offer fish like that, um, the confidence level is incredibly high that we know the fish are going to do fare very well um, in our customers' tanks. Right. And that's kind of the opposite approach of, of, I think, some stores. There's a lot of great retail brick and mortar stores around the country, but there's still a few around there that play basically hot potato with the fish. Get the fish in, sell them out of bags, you know, things like that. I have no idea of where the fish came from, and we really need to steer our industry away from that um, and, and be accountable as, as companies and as end consumers as well. All right, let's change gears a little bit. Um, when Live Aquaria really started becoming kind of a more of a big player on the scene, uh, along with that story was a lot more talk, a lot more emphasis on your coral farm. And your coral farm has been here all along. I visit every two years, and the corals up, upstairs look, look really good, and you've diversified your stock. Um, what, can, can you, what can you tell me about the coral farm? You guys have so many different corals. Do you know how many varieties of corals you have up there? Several hundred. Yeah, several hundred varieties, you know, different color morphs as well. Um, you know, we, we started to propagate corals in here, and doing WYSIWYG enabled us to, to, to bring in varieties of coral shipments, and we would definitely select kind of the the cream of the crop or unique color morphs or strains of corals and I think it's important to do that and to propagate them and, and get them in the marketplace to appease a variety of people. Right. Um, I, it's important for the industry moving forward to continue to do that. Very cool. I was, I was impressed because I've seen the coral farm grow over time. There's a lot of exotic corals up there. Um, I would say, oh, I estimated there was probably at least 100 species and 150 strains. So you know, a couple good hundred, you know, there's, you can set up a whole reef tank with the diversity of corals that are up there. Definitely, and, and we try to, to diversify our selections. We're not all Acropora, or we're not all entry level stuff. Oh so yeah, no, there's a spread across the board of everything. We try to appease, you know, the, the new consumer that, that wants, you know, some zini and soft corals, all the way up to, to the hardcore SPS enthusiast that wants, you know, the coolest, most colorful, you know, unique strains of acro. So. Right. So you, you been through our coral farm, you've been upstairs, you've seen all the stuff that we propagate, some corals that are, you know, we're getting ready to release and coming up. What's the most intriguing thing to you coral-wise that, that we have in here since you're in Um, you, and one thing that I really, really like is uh, your farm mycelians and the flat pectinia. You got a big diversity of them, and they're just perfect little shapes. And man, it seems like you should be like per perpetually sold out of those. And you got a big bunch of colonies, but I like the small ones. They just got good shape, good edges, good tissue, and everything. That that that's one of those like I feel like I'm on a bouquet. That's what I want of each. <laughs> that's one that stands out. Um, God, just the clams. You got some really really killer clams right now. The squamosas. I mean, they're not colorful, but they're really awesome patterns. They have great potential too. Those ORA squamosas, they're, they're farmed in the Marshall Islands or Micronesia. And some, of them got, some of them have blue edges. You bet. I mean, the, the longer we have them, just the more colorful they get. Even the terrazzo clams get really, really green. Um, pretty spectacular specimens that, that they're doing. What do you think is going on with uh, the recent spat of like really cool cultured clams? Uh, about two years ago, we had uh, a nice big rush of culture blue squamosas, and uh, you recently shared uh, the squamosea, the cross between the squamosa and the crochea, and I think I just saw a picture of a fresh maxea. Lemon sent me a picture and it looks like almost exactly like the original. Huh. Yeah. Huh. What do you think is going on with that hybridizing? 
I'm not sure. I mean, in Indonesia, obviously, there's there's a few clam farms, and I'm not sure what they're doing. If they're actually trying to maybe introduce more patterns or colors um, to try to strategically spawn these things um, to hybridize clams, I, I really don't know. But it's great that we see them in the trade and that we can get them in consumers' tanks. I mean, to We're sitting in your office, and we can see one small tank. There's a few tanks over here. So, can you give us a, just a brief description of the tanks that we can see before we move on to this one? Sure. Uh, in front of us is a 120 gallon small polyp stony coral tank. Uh, I'm still, in, like I said, a hardcore Acropora enthusiast. And, you know, it's, it's challenging to really maintain a really good Acropora laden tank. I mean, alkalinity, calcium levels, you know, stability is the key. and. Um, it's a challenge for even the best of us. I mean, it's a great it. foundation for my RAS. It's a lot of flow. Um, I'm a huge RAS man. Yeah, so there's, the, there's amazing uh, eight-line carry RAS in there. Yeah, that, that fish is probably five years old now, and I had no idea the fish ever got that large. Wow, well, I don't um, think but, the uh, fairy RAS has lived, or fat flash RAS has lived that long. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't look like an old fish. He's a little bump on his head. He's looking a little grandpa-ish to me, but I'm um, incredibly beautiful fish, and he displays every day in there, which is... Why I love wrasse actually, right? Because they will interact with each other. Um, males will display and try to even court other males, and it's just an incredible display to see and, and to photograph too. Since I'm a so hardcore, there's a lot. There's a lot of acro tanks out there, community tanks, but NPS tanks, non-photosynthetic uh, coral tanks are a lot more challenging. And you have one of the nicest ones I've ever seen with a huge diversity and you can keep a lot of corals. Can you tell me about your NPS tank and the things sure. that you've learned along the way? Yeah, NPS is a frontier that a lot of us uh, want to venture into, but maybe don't have the time or the resources to actually dedicate to it. They require an immense amount of food uh, to export those nutrients out of the water. They require very clean water. So it's a very labor-intensive um, kind of project to do NPS. But boy, I've learned a lot in the last few years. Um, what are some of your lessons? I, the hardest part is to be diligent about not introducing the simplest pests like Aptasia because you feed so much food to the, an MPS tank. Did you have Aptasia to begin with? Oh yeah, points? the tank was, was laden at times with, with Aptasia. Right. So butterfly fish have helped to alleviate that problem and some peppermint shrimp. And now, so you have a different kind of Aptasia looking anemone that kind of floats around? What is that? Yeah, I have no idea. It was a kind of a clear looking Aptasia, like an opaque or translucent one. Um, incredibly prolific, it just takes off everywhere in there. But, but it detaches and kind of floats around some? Yeah, but in certain flow characteristics, when, when the vortex kind of change, or if they're, they're on alternating sink, um, it'll, it'll blow one off a rock and they'll attach to a, a sea fan or gorgonia, and you, know, you definitely need to remove it because they, they sink pretty hard. So, If you had some advice for people who wanted to do an NPS tank, what would be some of your, your suggestions? I would make sure to, first off, not introduce substrate or not really stack the tank with a lot of rock work. Because any pore, crevice, anywhere where food, uneaten food, can rest, um, is just a, you know, detritus is going to yeah. accumulate and nitrates or phosphates are going to elevate really high. So, you know, try to be minimalistic in your aquascape um, and then be pretty diligent about inspecting your corals and, and, and dipping stuff before you, you know, you start stacking your tank up with, with livestock. So, it, what I find the most interesting actually about MPS is I think there's there's different characteristics or classes of NPS corals. We have large polyps only corals that are NPS corals. Uh, we have sea fans and gorgonias, the dendroneptia. Right. And I think they all take different environments as well. Yeah, not just different food sizes. You bet. I mean, it'd be really interesting to set up an NPS, LPS tank, just a sea fan gorgonia tank, and then that kind of the softy NPS type corals, right? Because they do require some different flow and different feeding techniques and so forth so that would be the ultimate NPS right. setup. This tank has been going for a long time. You have some of the original Panorama Pros from Exotic. It's doing really well. It's grown a lot over the years. Um, these are, these are two Gani Operas, I've watched these you know two years ago. It's, when this is closed up it's just like this branching mess. You can see how much it's grown. Um, so I got some of the corals and definitely give us a rundown of the fish in here that you can't necessarily see because there's some cool stuff. Well I've got a I love Clawfish still. So these are original pair of uh, Primian Picassos from ORA from probably five or six years ago, maybe. Um, 
So they're, they're one of my favorite fishes. Uh, one of them's got kind of a white mohawk looking thing, and yeah. the other's got a spot on his cheek. So very unique uh, color pattern fish. Um, I do condition a lot of little baby uh, lamproids in here. It's a little Anopsis femininus. And a, a, a tiny chotes grass as well, macrophoringodon chodai. Um, they're very, very neat. There's also the first captive bred maize angelfish in this tank yeah. from Valley yeah. Aqua Ridge. Yeah. Correct. So that'll be coming for sale soon in, in our diver's den. And people may wonder, how do you get the fish out of this tank? I, I have a, a trap that I use, so I'll bait the trap for several days and then very easily you know, remove fish. If we haven't done a write-up on it by the time this video come out, I definitely will, because yesterday without much effort at all, I caught it. the banded angel, a conspic angel, a maize angel, and a male feminist grass in the box in one in one shot. In one shot. That was pretty impressive. That was pretty cool. Um, there's also some uh, a little Flamella gobius, a sailfin uh, shrimp goby in here. Uh, there's uh, Leah Paproma from the Marshall Islands in here. That's pretty he reclusive. Comes right on. Very reclusive fish. But he comes out. Yeah, a little he, bit. He, he comes out to eat. You see him. I'm um, a little bit high, too high a flow, I think, for him. And the clown fish kind of scare him a little bit. But um, like Jake said, this this tank's been going for for a long time. These, Make, these are the original panoramas. Original panoramas, and and I really like uh, the ecozotic lights on here. The the tank. Obviously, grows coral like crazy. All I do is water changes you know, and does AB. I think, like, the only, I guess, controversy surrounding LEDs is we've had such a steady progress of technology, and, and we're all kind of tech heads and we upgrade a lot. But so there's a lot of, you know, people who want to see the evidence for the older LEDs lasting this long, and here you go. You've got five year old LEDs that are don't really look that dim at all. I mean, this tank, once it's settled in, it's it's amazing how stable it is, and you know this stuff just really thrives in here. It's hard to keep things small enough to be kept in this tank, right? This this gunny opera in the middle here from Australia. I mean, I cut the thing basically in half right. about a month ago. I mean, you can't even tell. You can't even tell. Yeah. It's, Not at all. it's still dominating the entire. I've been looking at this tank for for days, and I, I had no idea. That glove ball up up top, that clavularia, it just just takes off in there. Yeah. I'm constantly you know pruning that out of here and. So, I mean, it's a very, very functional, you know, a great small tank, great for a great space, it makes a beautiful display. So. so, you're a fish guy, at the core, that's your thing, you're really into the wrasses. Um, what are some of your favorite fish? You know, we, we, we're so in it, we can't have one, we can definitely have a few. So tell me about some of your favorites. My favorite fish are actually the ones that are very challenging fish. To, really? to either work with or condition up to, to, to get healthy, to get to the marketplace. Uh, my my all-time favorite fish is Anapsis femininus, the, the, the feminine wrasse or the blue striped feminine wrasse. Um, so fortunately, there's a, been a good supply in the last few years of femininus. Good is relative. Good is relative. <laughs> we, we hardly used to see the fish at all in the aquarium trade. Um, now, uh, from New Caledonia and the South Pacific, uh, we're, we're seeing a lot more of them, which, which is great. A um, lot. <laughs> Not that many. Maybe once a month, yeah, yeah, I'll see a few. But to me, that's a lot because before it was like you'd see one every two or three years. So, but that fish requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of food throughout the day. That small um, mouth and the really thick eaters. You bet. I mean, and how does that translate to the rest of the Namsus? I think it's similar. I mean, Anapsis wrasse like small food, and they have uh, their jaws is their morphology is such that. You know, they use some bony plates in their jaw to actually crush small crustaceans mm -hmm. to smash them so they can eat them. And you'll see it's common for the fish to spit food out and bring it back yeah, in their mouth. So it's got to be like the perfect size for them to get to get into their you know, digestive tract. But they're a type of fish that constantly picks throughout the day. They never will gorge themselves and then you're set. So that's why, to me, I feed these fish 10 to 15 times a day to condition them up and get them super strong to get into the market. So frequent feedings is part of the strategy. Small, small frequent feedings throughout the day is, at least for the first maybe six weeks, it's incredibly important for, for that fish. You get to handle a lot of really, really cool fish here at Live Aquaria. Um, and every year there's new surprises. Did you wanna just talk about a couple of the recent greatest hits that really tickled you? Well, I think the Valley Aqua Ridge, the Clarion Angel, was a, was a great yeah, fish yeah. to get in the marketplace. And you had, you know, you were in Valley, and you actually were holding the bags and got pictures of that fish. Yeah, that was, that was really cool. Yeah, I mean, it traveled to, to Europe, and then it came back to the United States. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that it's still thriving um, 
and a good customer is Aquarium in California. It is clear uh, after all. <laughs> Very hardy fish. Um, they, you know, with the maze coming on here, um, Septentry and Alice, the, the blue striped angel. That yeah, that's always been one of my favorite fish. And as we both know, the, the adults are, are very picky to acclimate. Even when they acclimate and they start getting well conditioned and eat, they can stop on a dime. So yeah. I am also looking forward to the, to the mazes. The solar flare flame angel, it's that, that hypovolanistic flame from Micronesia. Um, got another one in. Uh, it's just an awesome fish to see in person. They're yeah. incredibly bright colored. Absolutely. Awesome. So, I mean, that's neat. The unusual stuff. I'm still into it just like you. What about a few of the less obvious species? Um, I, Crocyria gulba, that gulba damsel right there, the canary damsel from the Cook Islands. I mean, it's a, it's a damsel fish, but it's bright yellow. Bright yellow with cool bright eyes. Blue eyes. Um, a perfect reef tank damsel because it's not overly aggressive. But, I mean, even the simplest damsel fish, and, you know, I'm enthusiastic about yeah. it. So. There's plenty of cool stuff out there that, you know, to, to each their own as well. So people are into angels, some are into butterflies. I'm an angel fish guy. Yeah. You're a rat's man. <laughs> so with that said, um, I've tried to give you this question already. What is on your wish list? You get to handle so much. What are some of the things that you would like to see, even just at once for your satisfaction? What would you like to handle and work with? I mean, since I'm a rat's guy, the, the Raleigh Shoals rats, Connie Hill is a fish that it's very unique in, in the fact that it's a labroid that doesn't have uh, a pelvic fins. So it's a Caniella apterygia. What's mm -hmm. is there a common name for it? The Raleigh Shoals wrasse. Okay. And it looks just like? Um, it looks like the, the, the Palauan wrasse. Oh, uh, right. So wrasse. it looks exactly the same. Not exactly the same. It looks really, really similar. Slight different changes of color. But it doesn't have ventral fins. Is there any explanation for why it doesn't have any ventral fins? That is so strange. I don't know. Maybe it's the habitat that it's lived in, it's developed to not need those. But I don't think wrasse use use their ventral or pelvic fins that often. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's rare that you see them extend them, so I don't know if they're like... Except for biolite. Rudders or... Biolite has nice long pelvic fins. Yeah. Right. So. Well, that's good. Um, you know, thanks you so much for sitting down with me, answering my questions. You got a great facility and uh, appreciate it when you do. Thanks for coming. Good to see you, Kevin. You too. All right.